Hello, our video today is going to cover chapter two of introductory chemistry, measurements and problem solving. So we're going to start with scientific notation. It's probably a topic you've seen in other classes, especially math classes, but it's very important to scientists. And the reason for that is because it's a way for us to write either really big numbers or really small numbers with a little bit more ease. And one of the reasons behind this is because big numbers have lots of zeros and it's easy to forget one or accidentally add one in when you're either writing it by hand or putting it in a calculator. And same thing with really little numbers. They're gonna have a lot of zeros in the front. So again, we want to have a way to kind of eliminate those. So we write it as a number times 10 to some power. The first part where the number is written is what we refer to as the decimal part, and this will always be between 1 and 10. And then the second half is called the exponential part, and it will be al always written as 10 to the power of an exponent, some number. If we have a negative exponent, then that means that our, our, our number in normal notation or standard notation is less than one. And if we have a positive exponent, that means that our number under standard notation is greater than one. So there's a couple examples here showing us how to go from a standard notation into scientific notation. And we're gonna practice this on on the next slide as well. But we have a number and the first step is going to be to find that decimal place and then we want to move that decimal place to the right of the first non-zero number. So we always want to have a number and then the decimal place and then however many numbers we need after it. So in this example with the 34 we move our decimal 1, 2, three, four places. And so we rewrite it as 3.4 times 10. And we're going to use the exponent four because we had to move it four places. And it's going to be a negative exponent because the original number in standard notation was less than one. So here's our steps. Oh, sorry, there we go, there's our steps. We're gonna practice this with a few different numbers. So we're gonna start with some numbers that are in standard notation. So we're gonna convert this number into a scientific notation. So the first step is to locate the decimal place. And when we have a number that's very large like this, often a decimal place isn't shown, but we know it's going to be at the very end of, of our number there. And so there's my decimal place. I'm going to move it to the right of the first non-zero. So I know I want my decimal place to end up right there. So I'm gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So when I rewrite this, I'm going to have one, 0.23 times 10 to the seventh, and I'm gonna keep that seven a positive number because my number in standard notation was larger than one. So let's do this with a smaller number. 0.00043. Now with small numbers, our decimal place is shown. So there's my decimal place, and I'm going to move it right here. I want it to the right of that four because that's my first non-zero. One, two, three, four. So we're going to rewrite this as 4.3 times 10 to the fourth. And that's going to be a negative four because we started with a number that was less than one. All right, so what if we're going the other direction? Let's start with 1.49 times 10 to the fifth. So essentially we're doing the same stuff, the same steps, but in the reverse order. So I have my decimal place. I know that I need to move it five places. Because it's a positive number, that means I need to make the number bigger. So I'm gonna move my decimal to the right. 
so one, two, three, four, five. So I have one, four, four, nine, and then those empty places right there get filled in with zeros to show the size of our number. Let's do one more. We're gonna start with 8.7 times 10 to the negative three. So I found my decimal place. I know I need to move it three places. Because that exponent is negative, I know that I need to move my decimal to, to the left. Um, I think my camera is, is not mirrored, so I'm pointing in the opposite direction there. Um, we need to move it to the left to make the number smaller than one. So we're gonna do one, two, three, so I'm gonna do eight, seven, and then again, these are going to be zeros as placeholders and put my decimal there. And then it's always a good idea to put that zero in front of the decimal place so that the decimal place is, is very obvious. All right, there we go. When we have a measurement, Every measurement has two parts, the number and the actual unit. We can't just say that the length of the table is five. We have to say five feet or five meters or five centimeters, maybe it's a doll table. The unit is comparing our measurement to a standard value. So we know the length of a foot or an inch, and so when we say that something is five inches, we know that it's five of these. We know that it has a standard value to it. The number itself is going to tell you how much precision was used when measuring that value. There's a difference between saying that the table is five feet long and saying that the table is 5.3762 feet long those were measured with very different precision values. So there's two different rulers on my screen here, and they're both measuring in centimeters, but the ruler on the top has markings for every tenth of a centimeter, so 1.1, 1.2. The ruler underneath it only has a mark for every half a half of a centimeter. So the ruler on the bottom is going to be less precise. It would give us a less certain value if we were using it for measuring. Because of this, because different tools have different precision built into them, we have to express that with the numbers we use. And we can do this by saying that the f all of the numbers except for the last one are certain. We know them with certainty. The last value is estimated. Now if we're using something like a ruler, we are doing the estimating. If we're using something digital, like a digital scale, a digital thermometer, the tool itself is doing that estimating for us. Now the other term that's on this slide is significant figures. When we do a measurement, all of the digits, including that estimated digit, are significant figures. And as we look at values, we want to know how many significant figures a number has. So there's a set of rules to determine this. And really, the tricky part about this is the zeros. Because the first rule says that all non-zero digits, one through nine, are significant figures. So really, the ones that the rest of the rules are dealing with are zeros. Rule number two, interior zeros are significant. So something, sometimes these are referred to as sandwiched zeros. We have 1.05, so that zero in between is a significant digit. Trailing zeros after a decimal point are significant. So that's referring to this zero right here. It's at the very end of the number after the decimal. It's not there to add any size information to the number. It's only there to add precision. 
Rule number four, trailing zeros before a decimal place are significant. So this zero right here, it is also an interior zero. It's in front of that decimal place though, and so that makes it significant. Here's our only rule that uses the word not. Leading zeros are not significant. So the zeros that are in the very front of this number here are not significant. They don't add to the precision of our measurement. They're only there to show us size. And then the last rule is really kind of a, a warning or a guideline. It says that trailing zeros at the end of a number without a decimal place are ambiguous, meaning we don't, we don't really know if those zeros are important or not, and they should be avoided. So the example here is the number 150. If this only has two significant figures, then we can rewrite it as 1.5 times 10 to the second. But if that zero is a significant digit, then we can rewrite it as 1.50 times 10 to the second, because now that zero is after a decimal place, and we are following one of the other rules. So essentially, we're forcing the zeros to move after the decimal place, and we can include them if they are significant, or remove them if they aren't. So let's look at a couple of examples here. So the question to go along with this is how many significant figures do each of these numbers have? So the first number there, we have 0 0.0035. We know that the three and the five are significant. They are non-zeros. The zeros that are in the front though, these are leading zeros. And leading zeros are not significant. So this number has two significant figures, or you can see up here, I often abbreviate it as just sig figs. The second number, we have a one, and an eight, so those are definitely significant. We have an interior zero, which is significant, and then we have a trailing zero after the decimal place, which is also significant. So all of those numbers are significant, giving us four significant figures. And then in our last one there, we have 150.2. In this one, we have a trailing zero in front of the decimal place or before the decimal place and three non-zeros. So all together we have four significant figures. There's one more category of numbers that we need to talk about and these are exact numbers. Exact numbers fall under three different categories. The first one is counting individual objects. So if we wanted to count how many test tubes were in the room, we could count that there was 45. There's not 44.8 or 45.1. This is counting objects. And our book also uses the word discrete, so counting discrete objects, meaning we're not going to have partial quantities. An exact number can also be a definition, and we often use this as conversion factors. So the example that's on there is one centimeter is exactly 0 0.01 meters, 12 inches is exactly one foot. These are definitions. And then the last one is integers, and so this comes up when we use equations. So the diameter of a circle divided by 2 gives us the radius. That 2 is an exact number. We're not dividing by 2.001 or 1.999. We're dividing by 2. Now the reason why we're emphasizing this information and looking at these significant figures is because when we get those measurements, we often need to do math with them. We want to convert them to other units or, or do some equations with them. And it's very important that the level of precision we started with is the same as the level of precision we end with. So we have to keep track of that as we do the math. So we're going to add some rules to our list. And we're going to have two different rules when we do math and incorporate significant figures. The first one is multiplication and division. 
The rule here is that we want our answer to have the same number of significant figures as the value with the fewest numbers. So I kind of think of this as the weakest link. You want your answer to have the same number as the least amount. So here's our problem. We have three significant figures times five significant figures times two significant figures. That's the least amount. So our answer, even though your calculator might give you this big long number, we're going to round it so that our answer has two significant figures. And this same rule is applied to, to our division as well. You go uncover the answer there. So four and three, three is definitely the smaller one, so our answer gets rounded to three significant figures. Rounding. So if we are getting a very long answer from our calculator, we're gonna have to cut it off or round it to the correct number of significant figures. So let me rewrite nine, Point nine six five. Okay. That was our answer on the last slide, and we needed to round it to three significant figures. So I count over one, two, there's my third one. I know that I want that to be the last significant digit. And so to decide what it will look like or how I'm going to round it, I look at the number behind it. Because it's five or larger, between five and nine, I'm going to round up. So my answer becomes 0 0.957. I don't think that was the exact number from the last slide, but that's okay. If our value is between zero to four, we're going to leave that digit the same, which actually means we're rounding down. So let me show you a quick example for that as well. If we want to round this to just two significant figures, so one, two, I look behind it, 1.345, because it's in that zero to four category, I'm going to round this to just 1.3. Now we use the phrase rounding down because 1.3 is smaller than 1.345. We've lost those last couple digits. Um, that's one of those phrases that I remember confusing me uh, when I took this class, and so I just wanted to make sure I pointed that out. All right, we did multiplication and division, so now we're going to do addition and subtraction. The rule behind this is different, but the purpose is the same. We're going to use the weakest link in our calculation to determine our answer. But instead of looking at significant figures, we're gonna look for the value with the fewest number of decimal places. So here's our, our math problem. We have 5.74, which has two decimal places, plus 0.823, which has three decimal places, plus 2.651, which has three decimal places. So two's the smallest. So our answer, our calculator tells us 9.214. We're going to cut that off at that second decimal place. We look behind it. Because it's a 4, we're going to keep the 1 as a 1, and we get 9.21. And the same process is followed with subtraction. Um, because we're putting this in our calculator, it can be a little bit more difficult to see. If we are doing this by hand, or at least setting it up by hand so you can see. It can help to write it out where you line up your decimal places and then you can see where you need to cut it off. So in this example over here, because my four is the last, or the first number that cuts off, then that's where our answer should cut off. What if you're doing a more complex problem that has multiplication or division with addition or subtraction? 
and really the rules don't change. It just means that you're going to do whatever the rule is based off of whatever the math function is. So here's our problem, 3.489 times 5.67 minus 2.3. You're still following order of operations, so we do parentheses first. We have subtraction, so we're gonna follow our decimal place rule. 5.67 minus 2.3 is going to give us 3.37. We do not want to round until we finish the problem completely. So notice that there's a line written under the three, and that's telling us that this number has two significant digits and one decimal place. We're leaving all of the digits there so that we don't round too early, but it is giving us an indication of where the significant figures stop. So the second half of the math is multiplication. We have four significant figures times two significant figures. So that means we're gonna stop this at two significant figures. So we're gonna do a couple practice ones here. So our first one is just multiplication. We have 2.506 times 0 0.0940 and so when we put this into our calculator remember your calculator does not know what sig figs are or care so our calculator tells us that the answer is 0 0.023556 when we go back and look at the numbers that were being used we have four significant figures and three significant figures so remember those leading zeros don't count. So three is smaller than four. So we're going to round our answer to three significant figures. So there's my third non-zero or third significant digit because remember those leading zeros don't count in this value either. The number behind it is a five. So I'm gonna round my answer up. So we have 0 0.0236. So in the second problem, we have addition and division. So we have 2.30 plus 6.508 divided by 0 0.50. So we're gonna do the addition first. We have two decimal places and three decimal places. Oops, use the right letters there. So I'm gonna add these together. My calculator tells me that it is eight point eight zero eight and I'm not going to round this but I am going to underline the zero because that's the second decimal place then I'm going to divide this by 0 0.50 and my calculator tells me 17.616 and now because we're using division we want to look at significant figures. So this value has three significant figures, the eight, the eight, and the zero. And this one has two significant figures. So that means that our final answer should have two significant figures. So there's my second significant figure. I look behind it, and again, I'm gonna round up. So the answer to this problem rounds to 18 because that gives us our two significant figures. The direction we're headed now is looking at the actual units themselves. So these are the standard units and they are the metric system for the most part. Um, when we use these units, it allows us to have a universal language throughout science. The majority of the world does use metric units. Because we're using meter as a standard length, for example, we wanna be able to express that in very large values, like a megameter, and very small units, like a micrometer. So this is a way to use prefixes to change the size of our unit, but still stay within that metric system. And this is one of the reasons why the metric system is so widely used, because it's built on a base 10 system. 
So it's easy to convert between different units. So we're going to do a conversion here. The numbers that are on the side over here are how I like to do the conversions with this. Now, if you learned it another way and it works for you, that is great. Um, I try and teach it one way so it doesn't get confusing, but I want you to use the way that makes sense to you. So I'm going to show you how to use those numbers as conversion factors. We're going to convert 100, or excuse me, 1,245 kilograms to megagrams. Now, our pathway to do this, we're going to go from kilograms back to that base unit of grams and then into megagrams. So we're going to need two conversion factors for this. Really, we need to know the definition of kilo and the definition of mega. So kilo is 10 to the third. And mega is 10 to the sixth. There we go. So as I set this up, I'm going to start with the number that I was given, the 1,245 kilograms. I'm going to actually just fill my units in first. Kilograms to grams, grams to megagrams. Now, one thing I want to point out, just kind of a little side note, but notice that this is a capital M. There's also a lowercase m, which would be milligrams. There's also a microgram, but we use a Greek letter for that. So using capital versus lowercase letters is very important in how you write or type things. Now, when we fill in the actual numbers for this, when we do this with metric prefixes, we're always going to have 10 to the something is equal to 1. The 10 to the something is going to go with our base unit, and the 1 is going to go with our prefix. So 1, 1. And I'm going to have a 10 to the third and a 10 to the sixth. There are 10 to the third grams in one kilogram, and there's 10 to the sixth grams in one megagram. So as we multiply through this, we are going to get 1.245 megagrams. When we are sticking with the same base unit and just changing the prefix, the number isn't going to change just where the decimal place is. So if you get a number that is starts with a six or starts with a five, you know that something has gone wrong. So just something to be aware of. Now, not every unit we use stays within that metric prefix family. So we do have to be able to convert within all types of units. There's some unit math rules on here, but really the most important one for us is this one right here. A unit divided by a unit will give us a one. Now the reason why we care about this is because it allows us to cancel out those units when we're doing math. And the units are included in the math equation just like the numbers are. Now this process is also called dimensional analysis. It's called unit conversion. So there's a couple different names for it. I think dimensional analysis is just the fancy name for it. In order to convert units, and we did this a little bit on our last slide, but in order to convert units, we're going to use a conversion factor. And this is my approach up here. I put the unit that I want on the top divided by the unit that I already have. This allows the previous unit to cancel out and leave us with the unit we're trying to get. We can use more than one conversion factor in a string or in a line, and we'll do a practice one that looks like that. So we're going to do two practice problems after we look at um, kind of the approach for this. So I divided up, and this is pretty much how the book does it. I think I've simplified it or summarized it a little bit more, but this is the approach that I take. So the first step is to figure out what your given information is. 
Now in word problems, you know that sometimes they give you stuff you don't need, give you extra information. So you have to figure out what we, what we care about, and what we need. The second step is what are we trying to find? What measurement are we looking for? What unit are we looking for? The third one is to kind of come up with your solution map. Really, how do we get from here to here and what conversion factors do we need in that process? Table 2.3 in your book has some good common conversion factors and of course you can just Google conversion factors and find a bunch of tables as well. Step number four is to solve it, to actually put the numbers in your calculator. And the step number five is to check it. And when we check it, we want to check our units to make sure everything is canceling out. And then we also want to check the size of our number. We want to make sure that the size of our number makes sense. So if we started with a very large volume, we should end with a very large volume. It just might have a different unit. And that can sometimes be difficult to conceptualize or see. So um, we want to do our best with it, but it might not always be useful. So we're gonna do a couple practice problems here. The first one is just going to be a one-step problem, and then the second one will be a two-step problem. So this one says, how many meters are equal to 132 inches? And I have a little conversion table over there on the side. So we know that our given is 132 inches, and we know what we're trying to find is that same length, but in meters, so to go from inches to meters, I can look on my table here, and it says that one inch is equal to 0 0.025 meters. So I have my given, I have my find, I have my solution map with its conversion factor, so the next step is to, is to solve it. So I'm gonna start with my given, 132 inches, For my conversion factor, I'm gonna fill in my units first. Want over have, I have inches, I want meters, and then we look at the numbers associated with them. It's one inch and 0 0.025 meters. So we put this in our calculator. Our calculator tells us 3.3528 And I'm gonna do a couple more things here. We know that our inches are canceling now because we have one on the top and one on the bottom. So we're left with meters. So I'm gonna add a meters over here. So we checked our units. If we check our size, 132 inches. We know inches are very small. So we have a big number value. A meter is larger. So we should have a smaller number value. So that, that works. And then the last one is significant figures. The number we started with has three significant figures. Our conversion factor here is an exact number because it is a definition. So our answer should have three significant figures. So there's my third one. I look behind it. It's between zero and four. So we're going to keep the five a five. So our final answer. 3.35 meters. All right, next one. How many centimeters are equal to 45 yards? So our given, 45 yards. Our find, centimeters. So we're gonna start with yards. We always start with our given, and we wanna convert it to centimeters. When we look on our table over here, we don't have a direct conversion for that. We can go from yards to meters, and we know how to go from meters to centimeters, so we'll need two conversion factors. We know that one yard is 0.9144 meters, and we know that one centimeter is 10 to the negative second meters. That goes back to our prefix table. So we have all the information we need to get it set up. So we're gonna do 45, yards and put yards on the bottom meters on the top 
meters on the bottom, centimeters on the top. So without the numbers in there, I can easily see that I have a yard on the top and on the bottom, a meter on the top and on the bottom so that my units will cancel out. And then I can fill in my values. So based off of my first conversion factor, one yard is 0.9144 meters. And then my second conversion factor tells me that 10 to the negative second meters is one centimeter. So we put that in our calculator and our calculator tells us 4,111, no, 114.8 centimeters. And I know it's centimeters because I can see my yards canceling and my meters canceling and I'm left with centimeters. We can double check the size. A yard is a larger unit than a centimeter, so my number should be increasing. And it definitely does. And so the last thing is significant figures. We're starting with two significant figures. The conversion factors don't count because they're exact numbers. So two, we're going to round it off right here. So we get 4,100 centimeters. Now, one of our sig fig rules told us that zeros at the end without a decimal place are not great to use. So I'm going to rewrite this as 4.1 times 10 to the third centimeters, and that will be my final answer. Now, sometimes we will have units that are raised to a power. This is most common with areas and volumes. So areas would have squared units and volumes would have cubed units. So when we have this, we have to square or cube the conversion factor as well. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. If we need to have inches cubed or centimeters cubed, then we have to cube that conversion factor as well. And notice that as we go into that cubed version, the number and the units are cubed. And then the second or last value written there is after the math has been done. So one cubed is one, 2.54 cubed is 16.4. So we're gonna do one practice one with this. How many square miles are equal to 52.0 meters squared? So here is our conversion factor we know we'll need. Our given is 52 meters squared. Our find is how many square miles is that? And we know to go from meters to miles, there are six, 1,609 meters in one mile. But we don't just want meters and miles, we want square meters and square miles. So we're just going to put a little square next to each of these. And I'm just going to set it up. 52 meters squared. Meter squared. Mile squared. And then we fill in our units. So we know that there are 1,609 square meters for every one square mile. One squared is one, so I'm not going to put the square in there. When we put this into our calculator, we're going to get a very small number because we're dividing 52 by something that is very small. I'm going to look at my notes here, make sure I get the correct number of zeros. So we get 0 0.00002001. So we want to do a couple things, as we know. We want to check our units. Meters squared cancel out. We're left with miles squared. We did end up with a much smaller number. A mile, a square mile is much larger than a square meter. So we're going to have a smaller numerical value. And then the third thing is our significant figures. We started with three significant figures, so we want to end with three. So there's my last one. So that zero is gonna round up to a one, but I also wanna convert this over to scientific notation because it is such a small value. So there's my decimal place. One, two, three, four, five. So 2.01 times 10 to the negative fifth 
miles squared. So that was a good example. We had um, some scientific notation, some rounding, some significant figures, a good value there. All right, our, our last topic then for the chapter is density. Density is what we call a derived unit, meaning it needs a couple units in order to happen. It is a ratio of the mass to a volume. We have some some common units on this on the slide there. They're not the units that have to be used, but they're the ones that we often see get used for solids, liquids, and gases. Solids are more dense than liquids, and liquids are much more dense than gases. When we have a lot of greater than or less than signs in a row, it's like adding varies or much to the front of it. Um, of course, there's an exception to this, and the exception is ice. We know that ice floats in water because it is less dense. Water is weird, and we'll talk more about water in later chapters. Here's our formula. Density equals mass over volume. The way that I was taught to remember this is to draw a heart. So we have mass over volume, the M on the top, the V on the bottom. It's silly. The silly things stick in your head. Density can be used as a conversion factor. Because it's in using two units, that's what all of our other conversion factors are using as well. So what is the mass of 4.0 centimeters cubed of lead? Well, we can see that the density of lead is 11.3 grams per centimeter cubed. So that means that for every centimeter cubed, it weighs 11.3 grams. So we can set it up using that density as a conversion factor. And it could be set up the way it was or flipped the other direction so that the centimeter cubed was on top if we were looking for a volume. So we're going to do one more practice problem here. This is our last slide. What is the volume in centimeters cubed of a gold ring with a mass of 16.5 grams? And we need to know the density of gold, so you can look this up. There's a table in your book that has some densities on it. I'm giving it to you here, though. And so we're going to start with our given information. We know that our given is 16.5 grams. We know our find is the volume and we want that volume in centimeters cubed and we know that to go from our mass to our volume we can use density as a conversion factor so 16.5 grams my density is in grams per centimeter cubed so i can use that as my conversion factor and right here it's written as 19.3 grams over centimeters cubed so we can just kind of separate those out 19.3 grams is equal to one centimeter cubed and then fill those numbers in so we'll have one centimeter cubed 19.3 grams we put that in our calculator and our calculator tells us 0 0.85492 so we're going to check it in our our three ways here Grams are canceling out, we're left with centimeters cubed. We know that one centimeter cubed weighs 19.3 grams. We have less than that, we have 16.5, so we should end up with less than a centimeter cubed, and we do. So the number size makes sense. And then the last thing is significant figures. We have three significant figures and three significant figures. Density does need to be taken into account when we're looking at significant figures. It's not a definition, it is a measured value. So we have three for both of them though, so we don't have to make any decisions. We just know that it needs to be three significant figures in our final answer. So we're going to cut it off right there. We look behind, we're going to round to 0.855 centimeters cubed. And there we go. That is the end of our chapter two video. Thank you.